Here Comes the Guillotine contains offensive language, mature content and adult themes. It is not suitable for a younger audience. This is a Global Player original podcast. Hello and welcome to Here Comes the Guillotine. I'm Frankie Boyle and I'm going to be talking to Susie McCabe and Christopher MacArthur Boyd. The delicious, fresh taste of Iron Brew. Ah, it's dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the juice of the gods. I love the tagline they have, which is um, Iron Brew gets you through. It's not many advertising slogans kind of capture the the agony of existence. I mean, just get through today, please, with my sugar and diabetes. That's kind of a high that noise. That's going on. <laughs> Haven't started yet, have we? No. <laughs> well, I mean, probably. It really would have worked better than <laughs> <laughs> I, It can't be any weirder than some of the shit that we've kept in, so we'll be fine. Some of the starts are random. <laughs> wow. Thanks, Andy. Wow. That's great. Look at the technical skill there. Is there a singer called CC Penis Town? Is that what that says? <laughs> CC. Oh, it just went away. Just as soon as you turned it around, it went away, which Trouble. makes me look mental. Finally, CC like Penis? Peniston. Peniston. CC <laughs> <laughs> Peniston. <laughs> Fucking hell. That's a Rorschach test for your interest. CC Peniston. <laughs> That's what I'm headed. <laughs> What's, uh, how's the tour been? It's been long. Mm. Uh, I've done a lot so far. And uh, we've been listening to the audiobook of Barbara Streisand's autobiography, read by Barbara herself. Babs, great. Guess how long that is? I'll say eight hours. 48 wow. hours. Wow. Yeah. It's literally everything that's ever happened to her, every peckle she's ever been disappointed <laughs> by. She's got an incredible memory for food, which she talks about constantly. Ceaselessly. Is this why you two like it so <laughs> <Yeah>. much? Yeah. <laughs> Every time she has a new baked potato, I'm just like right there with her. Oh, just tell me more. Pesto dinata. She hasn't had a pesto dinata yet, but I think at some point. So it's I found a copy of this book in a WH Smith on the road. Um, and it's 900 pages long. Wow. 900 that is a big book. It's a tome. Your little, your little Adams could never oh, hold that. I can't, I can't do that. I've, that's why I have the tote bag, so I can use my <laughs> neck to support the weight of the bag. Christopher's every type of cliche you can imagine. What I uh, found interesting was that we were in our little chat, our little uh, WhatsApp chat, and you were having a day off, and you were at quite a nice hotel, and you were going for a sauna and a steam room, and you had been listening to this book, and I thought... I have never been out gayed in my life, but you two travelling and having a little spa day to yourselves and listening to Babs' autobiography might be the campus thing. It's a very interesting book on the level that most autobiographies in show business have got to have some level of, well, it was luck. You know, I was got quite lucky. You know, it doesn't matter how you. Where she's like... Well, I'm Barbara Streisand. It's not <laughs> fucking luck, is it? No. So, like, loads of the staff were just... I did this audition, and, like, the the director fell to his knees weeping and later wrote this thing comparing me to Homer. Yeah. <laughs> you <know>? Wow. <laughs> you're just like, well, <laughs> it's kind of different because you're just like, well, it is the weight of this incredible kind of talent. There is an incredible aspect of it, and this episode isn't sponsored by Barb's or Babs, but... I will say that there's an incredible kind of thing of it where I guess because she must own the rights to all her music, she'll just talk about a performance and then in the audiobook the song will start playing. Oh. And like that bit, I wasn't Parades Go Marching By, it was some, some other song, Parades Go By or something, but it was like the last note, she just like carried it for like, must be 35 seconds, just this incredible high note and you're just like, oh that's... You might have person. been Happy Days Are Here Again. Happy Days Are Here Again. <laughs> <laughs> it's, very, it's very evocative about the period where she's playing in bars. So what's the bar she plays in called again? The she one play, in Boston? The one she, plays, she plays in this bar in New York for ages. But like, you'd imagine when they come up with tra- time travel, a lot of rich gay dudes 
In fact, <laughs> probably half her audience at the time was time travelling gays. Yeah. yeah, everybody was vaping and people didn't know what was going on. <laughs> That's not vaping, that was poppers. <laughs> tell me, tell me this. Uh, does she talk about singing in the gay bathhouses? Mm, no, not so much. She starts out doing a uh, a competition in a gay bar, and she has this guy called <laughs> Barry, who knows the gay scene, who Barbara describes as gay in the book. But Barry has written an alternative book, saying that they were lovers. Oh, and there's a lot of. I mean, we don't know the full story. Obviously, but there's a lot. Of, Obviously, <laughs> there's a lot of points where Barbara goes, "Oh, I don't, I don't really remember what happened there." And you're kind of like, "Will you remember when the the price of a sandwich went up by like twenty cents, or when they changed the mayonnaise and some like lunch that you liked in the forties? It's <laughs> unlikely that you've forgotten it." So she go, she goes to like her first Tony Awards. She goes, "I can't remember anything about it," and I'm like, "You must, you must, yeah, you remember, I can't remember absolutely anything. everything." Yeah. And uh, you're talking about how she says there's no luck uh, because she is who she is. On a much lesser scale, I remember listening to Radio 2 one day with my uh, ex-wife and she was a big musical theatre fan and we were driving uh, along the motorway and I wanted to listen to the football. She wanted to listen to Elaine Page on Sunday on Radio (laughs) 2. And Elaine Page played the classic I Know Him So Well from the musical Chess, <laughs> right? Her and Babs Dixon, another Babs that can yeah, hold a note. Yeah, yeah. And then after that song ended, she then said, as a special treat for all you listeners, I'm going to play the song again, but this time it's me, as me, singing both parts. And <laughs> then to sing both parts of this song. I was like... No, surely you can't get away with that. But Elaine Page, she can get away with it. I honestly thought you were going to say that as a special treat for the listeners. She was going to give you the football scores. Uh, <laughs> that would have been amazing. But yeah, so Babs, Babs in a spa. Babs in a spa. It's, I mean, I think there's a. a we were staying, I was staying in London there, and then um, I snuck up pile into the steam room, and we were having a good splash about in a wee steam and a wee sauna. It's a very macho thing, I think. Very masculine. You think so? Not if you're listening to, <laughs> to Barbara Streisand's <laughs> life story. If you're listening to Pantera or Metallica or something before it. You well, know. I mean, it was that thing from the Romans, wasn't it? That whole kind of bathhouse thing. Like, we were in uh, Turkey last June and we went for a hammam. Have you ever had a hammam? Yeah. This guy's yeah. been hammamming it up. Yeah. What? So, uh, the hotel we were in, their sister hotel, they were doing this, so it was massage, three hours we were in. So the first thing they done uh, when we arrived is that we had a massage, a, a kind of massage, shower, do that. And then they lie you down on the marble. So you're in this, basically this old kind of bathhouse and you lie down the marble and they get this bag that's filled with bubbles and and put it over you. A bubble bag? Yeah, a bubble bag. <laughs> and then they, uh, and they bear in mind, it's like 45 degrees outside, and then they get cold water and rinse. It's wow. it's genuinely, I was like, this is biblical. But I had a guy, so uh, me and my wife were getting done at the same time, so the guy that was giving me my massage was literally like a young guy. He literally had a loincloth on. And then... <laughs> The woman who was giving Nicola her massage looked like an Amazonian princess and I was absolutely <laughs> furious. It was the least <laughs> relaxing thing I've ever done. I was like, get your hands off my wife. <laughs> I was furious. But yeah, and then we got the massage with all the oils and some uh, coconut. And then we had a mud, like a face mask, a mud pack. And then they rinsed us. Oh, honestly, it was amazing. What an experience that was. And we, it was nice and cool because it was 45 degrees outside and I was dying. should start that in Glasgow. People Mid-bass. would be like, yeah, they, they, they Glasgow Hammam guys, they used to have a podcast. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> hammam guys? Yeah. yeah, here comes the Hammam. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Honestly, it's biblical. 
I don't know if I'm, uh, you know, we're going to go to Ireland soon and the tour manager, Barbara, who's been mentioned, another Barbara. Another but not, not, as, not as Strys. Not as Strys. Not the s Not Strysand. <laughs> not Strysand, which the, the, the big Babs is really... <laughs> She's so annoyed that people call her Strysand <laughs> that she found out Siri calls her Strysand. <laughs> and she phoned up Tim Cook at Apple and made him change it. No, she didn't. She did. No way. Yeah. She's that powerful. sand. She's very keen on that. Yeah. That is powerful. Yeah. That's real um, power. So, our Babs, she said that when we get to Dublin, she has a, she knows a masseuse called Jimmy, and he's going to come out and rearrange my skeleton, I think. Excellent. And I'm scared. Oh, no, it's good. Have you had a massage before? Never once. Oh, it's amazing. Nobody's ever touched me once. <laughs> I find that every Irish monsieur I've ever had has talked constantly throughout it. Just stop it. Like I I find in general, this might be a stereotype, but anytime you meet a quiet Irish person, they're just taking a very, very deep breath. <laughs> Before they talk again. <laughs> just to get it all out in one go. A massage is great because my back's a bit terrible. I go quite often and uh, I was in Newcastle at the weekend there and I went for a Thai massage and that is basically just letting somebody give you an absolute tanking. I do. I was leathered. I was basically leathered. Square go, please. See as soon as you hear the crocs coming off (laughs) your line, this woman's going to walk up my spine. And she was walking up my spine while then holding, basically trying to make my foot hit my, hit my shoulder while wow. she was walking up my back. And I was like, probably going to be paralysed after this. Yeah. But it was great. I felt really sore the next day, but the following day I felt amazing. You guys need massage guns. Massage I've got guns. a massage gun. Go yeah, it's so great. So- if any massage guns wants to sponsor the pod, oh yeah, jump aboard because we are enthusiasts. I love how me and Frankie have got the sleep apps, <laughs> the massage guns, going for her mum's Christopher's life. No, I'm absolutely fine. You two no, geriatrics. I'm feeling it. I started doing um, Pilates this week to try and oh my, God, my skeleton is just folded in on itself. So I've been teaching myself Pilates. What's happened to your skeleton? I'm just folded up. I'm always sitting, you know, I'm going. It's the stresses of tour life. It's the nice <laughs> stress. It's just like the tour's there. fine, it's you. It's you <laughs> that's the problem. It's not the tour. Is it all the kind of sitting in a car and stuff, do you think? I've just, I've always been a wee computer guy. My whole life sitting at a desk for hours and I'm, I'm just naturally folded forwards like a wee, a wee quaver or something. So <laughs> The technology lean. Yeah, my yoga teacher calls it. The technology was leaning into uh-huh. screen. Yeah, oh, is this when they think in generations to come they're going to have like overemphasized thumbs? Yeah, like iguanodons. You seen that dinosaur? The iguanodon with the yeah, big yeah, thumb. Yeah, yeah, and the, they're going to have like hump. We're going to have hunches, and basically we're all going to look like Quasimodo <laughs> within a few hundred years because of the hunch, <laughs> the hunchback, of the hunchback, the hunch. And just sitting playing computer games on the phone. Have you seen that new Apple thing? With the... Oh, like the... The Vision Quest? Thing? Is that what it's called? Yeah. yeah. That's mental. Is that what it's called? Vision Quest? Is that something like a that. A book I've read about goblins? That's a choose your own adventure. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well done. We've lasted 10 minutes before we got to the goblin. <laughs> <laughs> what an achievement. But no, have you seen it? So, the, like, the whole idea is that it's, you can just... Have like your calendar and your email and everything just opened right in front of you, and you just. Put it <laughs> it's right that way a book, though. <laughs> I know. You can have your calendar right there. But this is how, this is how they're selling it. This what is how they're selling freaks. it. We're not very far from the first time I thought I was in the metaverse or whatever is used as a criminal defence. Mm. In my defence, Your Honour, I thought I was in the metaverse. <laughs> I did a mini colour strike said. You hear that, TC? <laughs> he was in the metaverse. It's a very easy mistake to make. <laughs> I, I mean, um, I'm trying to think of, like, it just doesn't seem any better than the way things are, like, if there was like some kind of VR thing where 
I'm just trying to think of how it would be better than this life, but it would have to be more than just... The issue is the people that are making these things are quite limited in their imaginations because they're all quite corporate business people, so they're not really thinking of radical things to do with VR. It's all just, here's your calendar. Here you can have a meeting with people that you work with and get your ideas out to better increase the amount of money you can make. And nobody's like, here's the capability to like become a spider. Do you know yeah. what I mean? You can have a meeting where you're on an ass to mouth sexual daisy chain with the Justice League. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the That's problem I is capitalism. <laughs> the problem is, so like Mark Zuckerberg's demo for the metaverse is like him in a lecture theatre yeah. with a sweater on and they're like, as part of the demo, they're saying, we're going to sell people different outfits to wear <laughs> the metaverse. And you're it's, like, fuck off. That's basically what you do when you get a switch or a Wii. And so you just make. But I mean that's it. The thing that the 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 the, the create your own me thing in the Nintendo Wii was better than the fucking uh, create your metaverse identity thing. That Zucker, I mean Zuckerberg's just such a wee talentless, emotionless freak. Tequila worm. Yeah, he's just a wee, wee hang at the bottom of a bottle. And you just fucking throw him in the bin. He should be thrown in the bin. Here's something that gets me big time. Seeing the Matrix when you come out of the Matrix. And you realise that everything you thought was a lie, none of this was real. Why would you ever believe anything again? Yeah. So when the people go, oh, we're all on a ship now, you'd be like, are we fuck? <laughs> I have no idea where we are. Yeah, this is a game. You really hate Zuckerberg. I like, do. That I, really came across. I really do. I mean, I'm just grumpy. <laughs> Because my, my homemade Pilates, I've injured myself, but um, I think uh, the thing with Zuckerberg is it's just Facebook, when I was a wee guy, was so perfect, and then he kind of brought in all the data capturing shit, and all the fucking nonsense in the Facebook marketplace, and, and uh, the algorithm's shit now, and it's just, it was such a pure, raw, good idea that he then used to fucking become a millionaire by selling data and do, do you know what it is though facebook it's the third draw down in your kitchen who would have thought that like old photos mm. recipes mm -hmm. and shit you didn't want that you wanted to sell was going to make some guy a billionaire yeah and we just all rammed all that stuff in a drawer and then suddenly it was like gold yeah i remember when they brought in the the things you could like you could like stuff and it said just type in all the stuff you like and i was like oh wow somebody's asking me what i like this is great i like the smiths i like ray mysterio i like fucking spider-man and now he's taken all that and he's sold me adverts adverts directly to me to these mad companies and he's became a billionaire and he's just an asshole man you get yeah. blocked these days for saying you like fucking spider-man <laughs> are you <laughs> Not by me. <laughs> you know, that's, I'm for that's your community, really. The Spider Man fuckers. Spider Man is the ultimate fucking cuck, man. He's, no. like, he's a cuck to Don't capitalism. <laughs> he's selling, well, it's, it's an instructive story. He's selling pictures of himself <laughs> to the media that it's hates true. him. He's got, oh, what a thing to say what an absolute <laughs> prick Spider Man is. Okay, I'll get you one. Also, his spider sense was just like crippling panic attacks. Yeah, aye. that was anxiety. To aye. an ex extent, so was his. Jokes. We we <laughs> realise now that was just how afraid he was. That was why he was wisecracking. You would have anxiety if a goblin. Not to bring it back to the goblin, Susie, but always if the goblin, a green goblin, who oh. for some reason had the ability to fly around in a glider, despite that not being uh, established goblin trait. Um, really should have been glide man, maybe or something like that. There was, but, a, there was a great. Um, it's a ladybird Spider-Man book, like a wee small Spider-Man book that me and Thor had when he was a kid. And uh, it was like the Green Goblin, birth of the Green Goblin kind of thing. And the Green Goblin, who's like a billionaire tech developer. Spy Zuckerberg of his day. Yeah. Spider-Man catches him like stealing a wallet off some guy and like throws it in his face and goes, keep the change, webhead. <laughs> and you think, that's like dedication, man. You're a billionaire and you're out mugging the average Joe. <laughs> There's a, when I hear Green Goblin, I think of a comedy sketch that was produced by the Comedy Unit in Scotland and there was a reasonably well-known female, I don't even know if you could say... <laughs> I dread to think where this is going. Female stand-up. <laughs> she started out as a stand-up. It's now really a bit of an advertising... What's her name, Susan? Yeah, Susan. 
And um, Dad's a <laughs> lord type thing. And uh, she was naked, dressed as a green goblin. Naked? Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. How do you get that passed off, Com? Uh, who knows? <laughs> how do you get pissed anybody that way? <laughs> Wild. Yeah. Wild. So when I hear green goblin, it's you quite just triggering. Go straight, straight there. <laughs> <laughs> just go. Not for me. The thing, uh, the thing is, Spider Man selling pictures of himself. I suppose if anybody's going to profit from your um, kind of denigration in the media, it might as well be you, though. Do you this know what I mean? This is the only fans. It's the defense. only fans. Yeah, yeah. Spider Man wasn't that a cook. He was a he was an adult content maker. I would say. Yeah. Why yeah. not? Why not? Sex work. Well, he's out for a bit. Bit of a kink. Latex. Some people are into that type of stuff. Tying you know? people up in webs. <laughs> yeah, he's a bondage freak. <laughs> no, it sounds... was webs. Yep. <laughs> sounds like a bar in Amsterdam. <laughs> a man dressed like a spider tying you up and coming out his wrists. Maybe, maybe that is how he came. Maybe mm. Superman came like through his fucking laser eyes. And we just didn't... They were just like, this is fucking great. Not only am I like much more powerful than everyone else, I just come in public. <laughs> People fucking cheer me on. My cum kills people. <laughs> Fifteen minutes before we get the comment. <laughs> I'm going to, listeners, I'm going to try and implement a cum quota. It's, uh, Here comes the goblin team. Here comes the goblin. Here's a thing I was thinking on tour. We stayed in some not so great hotels as well. Yeah, I can imagine. I was thinking, there's a thing now where it's not even like authority that I'm annoyed by or bureaucracy or what. What is the word for it? Where it's just like... Private enterprise doesn't really work, you know. Capitalism just doesn't really work. So you just go into things, and like the shower doesn't work, and loads of stuff doesn't work. And I was thinking, at one point, as I meditated one morning, be more like the Buddha. And then I thought to myself, the Buddha would have got absolutely fucked by capitalism because he would have been too accepting, and they'd be like, "You're doing fucking late shifts again, Buddha." And been like, like, "I'm holiday booked." <laughs> <laughs> We don't care. <laughs> Get back in the stock room, <laughs> you fat bastard. Oh, that is harsh, man. That's not me, I was the boss. That was the way you said that. I didn't say harsh. that. Can I say, can he call the Buddha a bastard? <laughs> Jesus Christ, Christopher. I don't know what his man does, marital status was. I um, I I think capitalism is broken. I think it's actually just went all the way around so far to the extreme of what it is that we're now at the kind of End of communism. That's where we're at with capitalism. It's just went all the way around. It's fucking knackered. When the energy companies said, we need to put your prices up because of Putin, and everyone went, all right, and they went, but the shareholders are still getting a dividend. You went, fuck, even Thatcher wouldn't have tried to get away with that. And she loved free market capitalism, but fuck off. Do you know? The energy stuff's fucking... It's wild. wild, man. How did they get that? How how is it that way? And then everybody just goes. Eh. Oh, it's just an interesting connection. There's this guy I used to know called David Graeber who suddenly died, um, but he was a, a well, anthropologist, and um, he said that the reason Britain is so popular for foreign investors is that they think there'll never be a revolution here. No, there won't, because there never has been. Yeah. So that so they think. Um, you know, the reason, say, like, Russian oligarchs would buy loads of property in London, they'd go, that's safe, because um, we're essentially a kind of cock island. Hi. <laughs> but here's the weird connection. In Barbara Streisand's no. <laughs> <autobiography, laughs> she talked about, um, she talked about, she one of the songs that really launched her, she just sang a song on an album that was f of a musical that had been made by garment workers. They did this musical, their annual thing for the union, and it got picked up. And it went to Broadway for a year or something. And his mum was in it. Wow. David Graeber's mum. So wow. Uh, yeah, the revolution thing. Yeah, no, we won't, we won't ever have a revolution. Just look at the amount of people who queued to walk by a coffin of the Queen. Or you look at the amount of people who were camping out before the coronation and we we just, we don't have it in us because we have been told our entire life to dorf our cap. And do you know what? Anything. If you've got enough money, you can come into this country and buy up what you want. 
and that's just how it's going to be because that's what talks in this country. Including things that they're like, well, we can't nationalise that. We can't nationalise utilities and so on. And you're like, well, you know, pension funds from other countries have bought them. They're essentially <laughs> nationalised. It's just not your nature. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the trains in England and Wales, I think England and Wales, definitely in England, you know, the majority of the investment in them comes from European governments like the Spanish and then they get their profits and their dividends and reinvest it into their nationalised, their nationalised trains. Yeah, and yeah. we're sitting going, I can't get from Leeds to Preston. Yeah. That is a tricky route actually. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so cut through Wigan and fucking we'll never, and... we'll never have a revolution. We've never had a revolution and we will never have one until people kind of wake up, which they won't because they feel this really weird sense of nationalistic pride I feel like God's having a, some kind of revolution just now though against them like people they're just one of them's got ass problems one of them's fucking I think it's going, to, it's going to end like Hamlet they're all just going to be <laughs> gone in a day <laughs> the last one comes out in the balcony going yeah washing their hands <laughs> <laughs> like the <laughs> Russian revolution they just get taken away that's it yeah, I have it's... a theory you know Kate Middleton had gone to ground for a long time Mm. and disappeared and there was all sorts of conspiracy theories yeah I thought maybe old Chuck is on the way out mm. you know we've all gauged the tyre pressure on his fingers <laughs> thought <laughs> maybe he's not going to about much longer give it a squeeze yeah and then Kate disappears for a bit and maybe that's because they're like you're going to be queen now you need to be re-educated right so she's probably in the Tower of London Going through an intensive training course on being queen. Yeah, the I think technique. it's a very gentle course, right? But an old lady brings her her porridge every morning. Camilla. And comes in. No, no. At the very end, <laughs> it turns out it's Diana. <laughs> She's That's got fingernails that are like <laughs> talons, huge hoops. <laughs> you know, the ones that kind of curl in on themselves like sexy, for the Guinness World Book of Records. <laughs> Right. Uh, don't make the same mistakes as I made. I uh, I don't know what's going on there. What do you think is going on there? Because there's a whole lot of conspiracies about that, isn't it? Maybe she just wasn't well and she's just recuperating. I think she was getting implants, like <laughs> cybernetic implants. Fuck's sake! Like um, to make her more powerful. The bionic man. Like make man. Like the bionic man. Like I the bionic. Just, I don't know. I don't see the bionic woman. That would have made more sense. But <laughs> bionic man came first. Yeah, like the bionic, like the million dollar man. Six million dollar man. Six million dollar man. This is a very dated inflation. Jesus, took us a long time to get. To. I feel like an old heavyweight man. This old heavyweight's pawing for someone's head. Six million dollar man. That's the reference. I think they were trying to cannibalise her body parts for Charles. Go would her fingers work on him? No. <laughs> a grafted figure. Mm. Mm-hmm. What would happen to Camilla then? Because obviously she can't really become the queen mother. She's just someone your dad used to pump. Uh, <laughs> now you're fags. just somebody that my dad used to pump. <laughs> somebody. <laughs> just no, I, th- I think you managed to get the tune wrong enough that we can legally use it. <laughs> Did I ever tell you about my um, problem page? No. Escapade? What? I got hired to write this problem page for a magazine. Uh, which was loaded, right? Uh, and they went out of business soon after. But they still had a comeback, right? And they went, we're not going to be a kind of lads magazine anymore. We're going to be a bit better than that. And I was like, I'm not interested. They were going, do you want to write this problem page? And I was like, I'm, I'm not, you wouldn't like it. You know, you, and uh, they were like, you can, you can do anything you like here. It's loaded. And I've now since realised anytime someone says that, you're not even going to get the first thing printed. No. Because they're really talking to themselves. Yeah. You know, they're really trying to convince themselves. So they sent me this thing and it's a list of questions. Um, and, I, you know, they're just normal problem page questions and I just answer them and it's all pretty funny. And I'm like, oh yeah, I could see myself doing this. Mm. And then the last one is, what do you think of Prince Andrew? <laughs> and this was, at the time, Prince Andrew was a trade envoy. This is before we really knew anything. Because we tried to, uh, they tried to use him for like the World Cup bidding stuff, didn't they? We, Prince William, Prince Andrew, David Beckham... Did they use him for the Olympics as well, maybe? Jesus, he was busy. You Have you Googled that? I'm trying to. But um, 
he was a trade envoy anyway. So like part of his thing was like trying to sell British arms to like the Middle East and stuff, as I understood it anyway. And there was some story about he'd been on a yacht. Do you remember this? And he'd had some Saudis on a yacht. And I can remember making some joke at the time of going to my, so he got sacked. And you're like, imagine you're considered to not be of the right moral character to help Britain sell arms. Right? <laughs> but I, I imagine this gun runner's a bit dodgy, isn't he? <laughs> I sort of imagined he'd um, hosted a bunga bunga party or something, right? We didn't really know anything about Epstein or something at the time. In fact, no one did really till that Emily Metlis interview, right? Yep. Yeah. So. Um, they've got this question, what do you think of Prince Andrew? So I go, oh, what's, what is it about him? He's got that yacht and blah, blah, blah. So I write this thing, right? And I say, uh, Prince Andrew is actually like Britain's occult protector. <laughs> and one of the things he's done was he had them um, Stephen Hawking out on his yacht and he cast a kind of magic spell to trap Jimmy Savile's soul in Hawking's body. <laughs> So that he would never be a danger to humanity again. <laughs> and and, look and uh, I thought, well, this is a laugh, isn't yeah. it, Rex? It's just a bunch of characters you'd never kind of put together. And then they went, we can't put. Oh, and I said them, um, and he'd confined Hawking to an island where Hawking was uh, doing experiments where he launched ribbed missiles into black holes <laughs> to abuse the universe itself, right? And they went. <laughs> We can't say this because of a legal problem. I mean, what could the legal problem be? <laughs> Stephen Hawking isn't launching ribbed missiles into black holes. Prince Andrew hasn't trapped Savile's soul. In, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> and they went, no, we can't print it. We can't print the whole thing. And I went, you could redact it. You know, you could just black out the words. And I sent them a thing with, and it was just like black, 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 <laughs> Prince Andrew, black, 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 Stephen Hawking. And then I think they still said no. And it, it, it literally, it never came out. None of it ever came out. And then years later, it turned out Stephen Hawking was on Epstein's island, and this whole thing, I guess, in the in the media sense somewhere, they knew some of it. Mm-hmm. What a weird thing to have guessed! Accidentally stumbled on. <laughs> you like that freaky woman for Greece? What was her name? Frenchy. <laughs> <laughs> no, ancient Greece. Like, oh. um, there's a bunch of them. Uh, Cassandra, <laughs> Cassandra. Tell the truth, but never be believed. <laughs> yeah, there was a sketch I think it may have been the comic strip or Smith and Jones is this and the Green Goblin sketch no, so God, no we can up. never we can never talk about the Green Goblin sketch <laughs> the um, sketch is like basically Rolf Harris and an ice cream fan trying to lure children yeah, and mm-hmm. it was like made in like 1982 1983 something like that basically Rolf Harris is a child catcher Do- I think Rolf Harris Subconsciously was trying to drive children away because that <laughs> <laughs> it couldn't have been more openly frightening, yeah. You know, <laughs> and then you get this big kind of fucking, yeah, I've got get away. You've got siren. <laughs> it's a kind of warning, wasn't it? You've that got to ask man. yourself, man, though, like he done a portrait of the Queen, Savile was given the marriage advice out, he was heavily involved with the royal family. What's going on? Is it the pedo stuff? That makes the royal family like them, or is it the royal family liking them that makes them do pedo stuff? It's the kind what? of what I've never heard that theory before. <laughs> Where they're like, "Oh, I've got invited to the royal jubilee. I suppose I better abuse some kids." Do you think that's how it was? It's like you that just to fit in. Yeah, yeah. Oh well, if that's what they're into, well, it's like pretending you you, you ski so that you can fit in with a TV producer or something. Do you know what I mean? Oh. It's like that thing. That could go badly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> is God pious because God loves pious? That old Aristotle thing, isn't it? You know, is, are things good because God says they're good, or are they, does God say they're good that makes them good? Which iron brew have you had, man? <laughs> it's the delicious crisp taste that iron brew. Iron brew gets you through. It does. <laughs> See, be fair, it does. It's the ultimate hangover cure for me, iron brew. We are angling for some sponsorship. <laughs> Not even angling. We're being very blatant. I'm punting my ass out the window during lunch, just iron, going iron, iron brew. brew gets you through. It's the most blatant, like, this is a hangover thing that you could possibly uh, imagine. It is freezing cold iron brew out of a glass bottle. Because it tastes different. No, it does taste different. And do you know why that is? Why? It's because the glass bottles... Uh, I'm so happy this has came up. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the only things that I know about. <laughs> um, the glass bottles get made in Scotland and the plastic bottles get made in England, so they're used with English water uh-huh. versus Scottish water. 
Scottish tap water is purer because we nationalised our, well, sort of nationalised our water system. English tap water is full of shite and <laughs> cocaine. <laughs> uh, it's like fucking Richard Pryor's cum. <laughs> <water pen there. laughs> the amount of cum, the coke in it, <laughs> and cum probably. Um, so that's why the, the plastic stuff. And also, I think just sitting in the plastic, kind of, a lot of the microplastics get. You know, because there's microplastics in the water anyway. You put microplasticized water inside plastic, you'll get fucking macroplastic water. You'll be taking a laminated shit. <laughs> it just comes out completely sealed. <laughs> so, how does that work with the cans? So, I don't know. <laughs> now, if you sponsor us, we'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. you I, I like mean, a glass bottle uh, because <laughs> then I've had an iron brew, but I'm also armed. Yes, mm, always. Always. Nobody's going to. I love walking down the street with a glass bottle in my hand. (laughs) 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 That's just fucking blowing it. What? Now what, like, me saying that it's yeah. full of shite and coke? No, it's no. blowing it. No, the fucking, the, the violence edge. I, oh, okay, you, sorry. Using a much. refreshingly bubblegummy fizzy pop as a weapon. Yeah, it's brewed br- br- in Scotland to a secret recipe since 1901. That's a yeah, good thing so about we're it. looking at the possible sponsorship can. <laughs> These, um, they say it's full of cum and they like to attack people with the bottles. <laughs> <laughs> and cocaine. Um, maybe we'll get a Dr Pepper instead uh, so. maybe, maybe Susan Kalman then <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some Green Safe Goblin pair of hands. Yeah. <laughs> you know, She's good for the Bank of Scotland She's good for everything isn't she It's good though It's a great job <laughs> it is. I love it uh, Listen has it destroyed my um, Libido Libido Teeth <laughs> <laughs> Libido teeth <laughs> um, Mental health probably I mean it says in the back It's like um uh, may have adverse effect on activity and attention in children. And I was basically mainlining this stuff as a child, you know, just like IV drip. And I think it's, I mean, if you've listened to this podcast, you'll know something's went happened. <laughs> 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 I'm deranged in some sense. <laughs> but anyway, if you're out there, boss, it doesn't have to be angry, we can do limeade, cherry. Oh, cream soda? Mm-hmm. The pink and white. Get us on board for the whole range, man. I always thought that that kind of striped cream soda pattern that you get on bars, it was kind of quite a cummy cream. Stop. <laughs> a limeade and a massage gun. I could see myself advertising that. Absolutely. Moment. I'd happily have limeade and a massage gun. <laughs> also, that's quite worrying that you're telling me that cum is the colour of pink and yellow. Yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> it's not yellow, like, it's cream. It's, it's a, cream and a, pink. a gunky beige. If you're unhealthy, if I, you're drinking too much iron brew, that's what it's going to look like. What? <laughs> what the fuck? It's... <laughs> Your kid's going to be fucking Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> Even as a... Only my dreams. Gay woman, I'm pretty much <laughs> aware that male... Sperm shouldn't be that colour. I don't know. I don't go to the doctor. There. It's hard to get an appointment with the GP. I don't know. It's also I'm hard healthy. to like, come in front of him. Yeah, it's really hard to come in Is front of him. Is it though? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Sorry. Um, that much. I do. Uh, I do think we could do the whole range. We could do. Uh, <laughs> we could do, the whole range. do the whole range. Sponsor it all. <laughs> Bars cola. You were slagging off Iron oh. Brew recently on a podcast, weren't you? Sort of. Oh yeah, I'm on off menu, and the, but I'm only I only slag it off because I'm drinking a diet Iron Brew at the time as I'm doing the show. Because mm-hmm. you, you love it so what much. What does that taste like? And obviously, being an acerbic comedian from the turn <laughs> of the century, I make a joke. You've, you, you, your your part has been warped by toxic masculinity, <laughs> so you had to make fun of it. Exactly. Yeah. I'm barely in control of myself. I don't know if Off Menu is the most toxic podcast I've ever listened to. I think I was sitting here saying that that podcast has got toxic masculinity what? in it. It's oh, no, quite well, the it's stretch. O- it's only got toxic masculinity in it when I'm on. Yes, yes, I. <laughs> They're very nice. You've been I, listening to a lot of podcasts, Frankie, yes. haven't you? To try and because we're doing a podcast. Here comes a guillotine. You've been doing about market research. Yeah. 
So I'd not really listened to many podcasts. I I listened to a lot of the rest of history, mm-hmm. which I would recommend if you're ever doing a documentary about the British monarchy. <laughs> right. Not very much about it. I see what's happened it's to really, you. Really, really handy. Okay. Um, for BBC or Channel 4? If you 4? want to package some of their observations as your own <laughs> on Channel 4, um, it's a really great podcast. Okay, um, okay. And so that gets a pass. But I would say that generally podcasting is a centrist art form. Yeah. And if you look at the charts, it's full of people like Alistair Campbell, Rory Stewart, like literal actual centrist politicians Mm -hmm. in the top places in the charts. And all the celebrities as you go down are, I would say, not radical. (laughs) (laughs) You know, there's kind of like um, <laughs> this other stuff. There's a lot of like, they went to Cambridge, they went to Oxford, they're a politician. There's a lot of kind of very posh, established people. And listen, obviously Joe Rogan's a wank, right? And we've beat him a few times in the charts, but obviously Joe Rogan's a wank. But there is that kind of thing of he is one of the few people who is just a meathead UFC commentator, reality show host, who is not like that, do you know what I mean? You can see where the appeal is to people to hear somebody who isn't such a fucking wank. Yeah. <laughs> I hear what you're saying. That's happening in uh, America just now with the election. These um, minority marginalised communities are now, the men in them are now swaying towards Trump because they're wanting that whole Joe Rogan thing. It's that whole toxic masculinity, be a man, you know, Rolling back in the LGBT rights, certainly not into the gender politics, don't want their kids being taught anything like that. And these, I suppose this demographic that would traditionally have always voted Democrat are now going to Republican because they see Trump as that kind of political Joe Rogan. How thoroughly depressing. Well, I think it's sort of like a thing that's been happening for a long time, which is that the Republicans used to have quite a a blue-collar base. Mm. So it was what used to be called uh, Reagan Republicans. Which Um, is a bit like Thatcherism. (coughs) The the, the Thatcherist um, man in a van, Essex guy, in the early 80s, loads of money, the plasterer, that kind of guy. But because what they started to be saying as policy became so mental (laughs) that you couldn't really sell it to anyone... They had to go and like regroup their electoral coalitions, both in Britain and America. So in America, they went for the Christian right no. because they, well, what we're saying is obviously completely crazy. Like people who are, you know, working as a garage mechanic, they're not going to vote for this anymore. Um, so, like, we're going to need to bring them on board as many crazies as possible, and that's part of what you see in Britain. Um, of all this sort of anti-trans stuff and anti-LGBTQ stuff and all that kind of thing, is like, how do we get on board more wing nuts to try and get this thing up to a kind of critical mass? Because anyone who's thinking about this rationally isn't going to vote for us. So they were looking at the hawkers, the merch stalls at this kind of uh, Trump rally thing, and there was a badge that said, My Body, My Choice. Now... That, to me, says I am pro-abortion. But it wasn't about being pro-abortion. It was being anti-vaccine. Right, right. I wonder how many of them agree with that about the vaccine, but completely disagree with abortion. Also, those people think they're sceptics. I'm a vaccine vaccine sceptic. If you were a sceptic, do you reckon every celebrity (laughs) saying that they've not had the vaccination has had the vaccination or not. Of course they fucking had it. You fucking mugs. <laughs> you fucking mugs. They just want you on their fucking Patreon. They just want your money. They want your clicks. Yeah. There's a phrase for cultural issues that um being weaponized um for political gain. I don't use it, you know, because that's been come up with in a, in a think tank. And anytime people go... Oh, what about this? Or what about that buzzword? Or whatever. You're like, you don't have to use it. You don't have to use the frame that was come up with by people who hate you to discuss it. Yeah. Here's a very, a very grim 
uh, story. I am <clears throat> currently standing for rector. Oh, Glasgow, Glasgow Uni, Uni. right? Yeah. University of Glasgow. <laughs> Me and Frankie had a quite a, an in-depth discussion about it, didn't we? About why I should do it, why I should stand. And uh, on my flyer is me, and it's kind of blue background with kind of rainbow and it's got a little Palestine flag and uh, the LGBT flag with the trans section in it. And um, I f- I maybe, what, a 17, 18-year-old guy was like, fuck LGBT. Uh, two Muslim girls were making a video of themselves at my poster, like, fuck the gays, fuck the trans. And it honestly broke my heart. Not because it's me. I I can deal with that. Just the fact that that is the world that we are now living on. That somebody went to give a guy a flyer. And he just was like, nah, mate, I don't do poofs. And you're like, these are educated people. Some of them are educated and some of them are just have money. You know, there's a big difference. And I think a lot of these unicorns... (laughs) <laughs> and then there goes the rectorship uh, yeah, No offence to the, the, the great institution of uh, University of Glasgow But uh, you know a lot of the people there are fucking morons Yeah I get that But when you're sitting I watching I know that's not your opinion that's the potential No no I, I listen there's a lot of people in the world There's a lot of people in this studio are morons are like before me, But well, no I'm but man. But it is that thing when you go Are oh, you a young woman And you're from a marginalised community and this is how you think. So you can see that swell. You can see that that thing. And then you've got your Andrew Tates and your Joe Rogans that are just feeding into that narrative. And then you see the numbers and gender-based violence. And you're going, yeah. this is all just coming together. And a lot of it is men feeling that they don't belong because they, they feel that they've been emasculated. I think they think of society as general kind of like prevailing social mores mm. rather than government policy and um, the inherent nature of capitalism. Yeah. So like to some extent, you might feel emasculated because you're not able to get the kind of work you want anymore. You're not able to provide in the way that you, you would like to do. You're not able to buy a house or whatever, but that's not the that's not the fault of prevailing social mores no, or no. attitudes towards capitalism. gay people. No, it's capitalism. Yeah, and the people in charge. Yeah. We were talking about how we love... Adam Curtis, like when we're on tour, love Adam, Adam Curtis, Curtis documentaries. <laughs> but Christopher was saying there's always a bit in it where you sort of think. I went no, I have to go to the Louis <laughs> Theroux impression. Now. I went back to, but Adam Curtis is more like in the 12th century, uh, <laughs> France was struggling with bread. But to really understand this, you have to go back to the Aztec civilization of ancient Maya. Where people were throwing owl carcasses into a tunnel. I just like the bit where it said then he jumps something to like strange happened. John Terry or something. You're like, what the fuck is he going to do? But Christopher was saying, you know, they're great and they have all these theses yep, behind yep. them, but at some point you're just sort of like, yeah, but it's capitalism. <laughs> You know, and he never sort of goes to that bit of going, well, it's not, it's not Vladimir Putin's advisor starting a disinformation campaign. Blah, blah, blah. It's, it's basically the, the international structure of the world. Mm. You know, it's the international order, which might now be like breaking down irreparably. Um, Do you think it is breaking down? Do you think I it think will break down? I think there's something when a guy goes and an American serviceman goes and immolates himself in front of an embassy yeah. in Washington that says we're maybe not this can't go on yeah this can't go on but also it's it, it, what where is international human rights law now where is like the the accepted things that were referred to by previous generations post war yeah. yeah um but that generation's now gone pretty much on the whole so now we've got this it's almost like we've shed a skin we've shed a consciousness it's almost like we've just went a uh, human rights I mean that was a very post-war 20th century thing we should get rid of that for the 21st century because you know who needs it yeah remember the Iraq war like so there was like a whole thing of people going well, you can't do this because it, it you then erode all international norms if you go going and uh, perpetrating a war of aggression without a UN resolution without UN backing then, then there's Games a whole up. kind of international framework then that, that erodes, as well as all the stuff that you're going to do to the to the area of of the Middle East that's going to destabilise it. And like, 
And that just, all happened. Yeah. Of course, Britain. one of the people who manufactured that is now presenting the number one podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's so interesting how he's like, I'm really struggling with mental health. And it's like, you should be. <laughs> <laughs> that needs to come out, man. That what do you mean you can't say that? You can't fucking kill six million in Aggies. It was 600,000. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Six million. <laughs> That's not. It's where you reach for that number. <laughs> is the first thing people will say. I'm talking about numbers. Have you been to the fortune teller yet? Because a lot I, of people are are, are asking. Oh yeah. I have not. Um, <laughs> what a segue! <laughs> I thought that was a class. Speaking of the numbers, that, I thought uh, that was a class segue. Of it, like he's dead. Um, my my alt right friend mm-hmm, mm-hmm. has uh, not been in touch. Since the podcast came out, I think I might have blown it. <laughs> the woke so filth on your new global player um, podcast has put it off. I think. I think. Yeah, I think actually, yes. More than <laughs> more than discussing the day, I think it's just my general level of wokery absolutely <laughs> disgusts him. You've been having too many uh, spare days with your wee friend, <laughs> <laughs> and the homoerotic <laughs> tour, the final lap. I think we'll gloss over this second. <laughs> I see you've got a hope. It's going to be an interesting edit. Listen, people, interesting people want to know what's going on with the fortune teller. And Nothing. Nothing's happening. I have sourced a couple of fortune tellers. I think I've pretty much blown it with my wokery slash public discussion of a possible date. Mm-hmm. It's not happening. Sad. But has all hope gone? Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, Iron Brew gets you through. And that's what you need to keep doing. It's just doesn't matter what's going on in your personal life. Or... That would be a good advert if it was just someone with a glass iron brew bottle <laughs> doing the scene from Old Boy that comes down the corridor. <laughs> iron brew gets you through. Yeah. I'm talking about shards <laughs> of a 500 milliliter glass bottle embedded in a homeless person's face. Homeless person? What? It's hard to see you. They were ninjas, but they were kind of homeless ninjas. This fucking Nazi's going to date you now. <laughs> <laughs> Only in my dreams. <laughs> mm. We've been discussing a bit of Britain being a cuck island mm. when we've been on tour, which I think it is a bit. And that... Feeds into our whole no no revolution. Oh no, more bad things have happened. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> what an Let me just listen to Rory Stewart's podcast. That'll make me feel better. <laughs> Rory, so Rory Stewart's claim to fame is that he, like, administrated part of a, a, a country that had been illegally invaded during a war. Yeah. And Alistair Campbell was a key figure in provoking yeah. the war. The only thing I know about Rory is that he smoked heroin in Afghanistan, correct? Right. You heard about that? It's very free and available. It's like, that's like <laughs> iron brew to them. <laughs> <laughs> heroin gets you through as well. You know? So much of it. <laughs> um, but I think um, when he was over there, it, that was his excuse as well. It was it was, it was, was flowing like um, ginger, you know, and it was just, he was in someone's house and a pipe came his way. He had a toot. Someone went, that's heroin, by the way. He was like, oh, bloody hell, you know. Um, which we can all relate to. <laughs> He's like, I always smoked heroin. I went to him, what you been up to? He went, uh, well, uh, smoked heroin the other day. <laughs> I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, I went around to the steeler's house and like he didn't have any grass. And he went, I've got the heroin. That's how they get you. And I was like, um, yeah, that, like, you know that stupid thing that Tory politicians used to say where they'd go, uh, and then if there's no marijuana, they'll have heroin. And you're like, he actually did that. <laughs> And I mean, what was it like? I mean, it's pure dead relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> then I vomited for two days after. Takes the edge off, I'd yeah. imagine. It's so interesting, the types of people you meet. I don't know what you used to, but when you do stand up, you know, compared to growing up in the East End, being a wee specky guy, having friends who liked geeky stuff and having friends who liked football, but everybody was kind of just sound. And again, I need stand up, and I remember being. 21 on a car journey up to do a, a gig in Elgin and I was sitting with these two guys in their 40s and 50s and they just started talking about how they'd both smoked heroin at some point in their life and they just went I didn't like it and the other one went I know it was, it was shy isn't it it just made me sick and he was like it felt good but it just made me sick you know and I was like I don't think I'd be getting this conversation if I worked in like Morrison's but maybe I would there's a type of comedian 
who comes from a certain country. Let's try and gloss over the details here. <laughs> who have all smoked crack, yeah. right? And to me, that would be one of the most extreme things a you person could do. do. But um, I said to a comedian one time, oh, blah, 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 talking about crack. And he went, oh, yeah, you know, it's a bit like this. I was like, have you smoked crack? And he went, yeah. And so the next time I saw a comedian from that country, mm-hmm. I said, so and so said he'd smoke crack. And the guy was like, yeah, well, you know, if you can't get any coke or whatever. And I was like, what? Do you, yeah. Like, does everyone from that country smoke crack? And then I was doing a sketch one time that was like the A team, <laughs> but if they'd really been to Vietnam, so they'd kind of lost their minds. <laughs> And it's like they get locked in a shed and they get to building stuff and they build this massive <laughs> crack pipe. And it was really huge. And there was another comedian from that country in the sketch. And when they brought the pipe out, he went, you've done that wrong. You need a layer of ash Amazing. underneath it. And I was like, has everyone from this country... I can't believe you work with so many Welsh people. <laughs> <laughs> but there is one country where every standard comedian from it has smoked crack. What country is it? That is for... The- that's the listeners to guess. <laughs> it's engagement bait. Man, there's a bunch of good gigs in Belgium. I need to go over there and fucking <laughs> have some chocolate and have some. Uh, was it one of the French clown schools? Is yeah, that, is that know, what was I, going um, on? I'm studying at uh, what do you call it? Um, Gaulier, Gaul- uh, Philippe Gaulier. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, taught me how to smoke his cock and he taught <laughs> me how to smoke <laughs> crack cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> that old freak. He was pals with Hillary Clinton for a wee bit, wasn't he? The old uh, Philippe Gully. Really? Yeah, well, Clinton and her daughter went over and spoke to him, like, post uh, loss to Trump. And you're just like, how badly can you take a loss? She's on a show about clowning. Yeah. That, um, this really great clown act, Natalie Palamides. Chelsea's on, on it, or Hillary? Hillary? Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Big time. You don't need help releasing your inner clown if you lost an election to Donald Trump. Yeah. It's mental how all these comedians that go over to Gully, they're all fucking loaded. And it's like, I guess if you grow up working class, you don't need to. But he's doing find the right thing. He's funny. going, you'll be funnier if you have less money. You know? <laughs> he's taking it off from him. And he's helping him. It's yeah, actually it's true. It's true. <laughs> what, I, what a great bit of capitalism that is. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's weird that he thinks that they can all be funnier if they get naked. That's a lot of a lot of the stuff that you notice about the comedians. It's like, oh, my boobs came out, or my cock's dangling out, or something. Or your bum holes out, and it's like, come on, Philip, you've got to be Phil K for that, really. <laughs> you need to be the one exact person, Phil K. <laughs> Did I tell you my story about doing them um, Glasgow Green with? Phil K? No. So if Phil K, if you're listening, you don't know Phil, you should check him out because he's actually one of the the few authentic geniuses of stand-up. Mm-hmm. So Phil would genuinely improvise every show. The way that stand-ups kind of pretend to make up on yeah. the spot what they're doing, he yeah. literally does, does that, that and you can tell. What other people pretend to do, he's <laughs> doing for real. I mean, he's a, he's a genius. It's like a wizard in a, a, a room full of magicians. Yeah. Was it not Aberdeen? <laughs> and the gig in Aberdeen that he stood in the table and set fire to his balls with a tea light? <laughs> <laughs> you know the little, no, you know the done, little candle It doesn't always chapel. work You know <laughs> And as he said to me one time He said how could it work I'm rehearsing in public How could uh, it possibly yeah. work every time But one time Was he rehearsing for heaven <laughs> 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 One time We did this gig on Glasgow Green And it was What was it called Gig on the Green And it was like um, A music festival But they'd have a comedy tent During the day Which is about a thousand seater And Phil at the time was very famous in Scotland and he'd done an advert for like White and Mackay or mm-hmm. something like that and he was like a both alternative and kind of mainstream mm-hmm. famous person in Scotland and so he'd done the first day of this gig and just destroyed it and just been Phil and it was incredible right so everybody had turned up early to get their seat for this thing right? <laughs> Phil Kay's doing this gig and it was amazing yesterday so I go down there and Phil's not turned up Right, he's not there yet. And like um, the people there, the organisers, Joe Norris, went, uh, oh. why don't you just go on? Why don't you just go on and do your 20 while we wait for Phil? And they're literally sitting there going, Phil, Phil, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> and even though I was young at the time, I had the, the at least the strength to go, there's no way. There's no way I'm going out there. Why don't we just wait for Phil? Mm. And so Phil just appears. Ah! <laughs> right? and he this just, is amazing. He goes, ah, 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 I'm going to go on now. And right, so he's, he runs out. 
and he starts doing something and some guy in the crowd shouts so this is really early on this is a few sentences into it get your cock out and phil's known for getting his cock out and f- like yeah yeah this is before gollier was into it this is yeah this is when gollier got it <laughs> <laughs> this <laughs> oh god so this guy shouts out get your cock out and phil responds with I'll get my cock out if you get up here and wank it for me. <laughs> <laughs> the, guy, the guy, obviously, is at a fucking music festival in Glasgow Green, so he's like, sure, challenge accepted, right? Oh, no. And he gets up, and so there's a stage that's a few feet in the air that fills on. He's got his cock out, and this guy starts to fucking sprint towards it, right? <laughs> And the security, obviously, music security is slightly different from stand-up oh, yeah, security, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're used to people trying to jump on a stage. Mm. So he gets Not usually to, the, to wank a man. Not usually to wank a man. But this is a bit heavy for a Saturday afternoon gig, <laughs> though, isn't it? Just masturbating and getting a comedian off at three o'clock on a Saturday because well, the football's not on It's summer. I think Phil had correctly calculated that the guy was not going to make it to the stage <laughs> because on his arc upwards as he described the parabola towards the stage these two bouncers catch him on the upswing and just smash him into the ground wrestling style and he's just lying there like a kind of flesh swastika (laughs) he's just broken like he can't move and I'm like oh my god I've never seen anything like this you know and all I hear is Phil's voice going Frankie boy <laughs> I shake hands with him on the way to the bike and he's still got his cock out. Wow. Amazing. Thank God you didn't shake the cock. Yeah. That would have been a way to start your twenty. I think I was at that music festival, my dad took me. Right. And I was a wee boy. I you to, missed a treat. Yeah. I was too busy seeing Marlon Manson in the tent. Um I'd imagine that watching Phil K getting wanked off would have been less traumatic than watching maybe, Marilyn Manson. Maybe I did see it repress the memory and that's how I've ended up. Where, where you are this <laughs> <laughs> desperately punting my ass for, for a Iron Brew, Iron Brew sponsorship <laughs> despite the fact it's eroded every single good quality of my life <laughs> Iron Brew we'll get our cock out if you come over and whack it for us <laughs> new slogan's doing surprisingly well <laughs> He did do a, He did do that in Aberdeen, though. I'm pretty sure he jumped off the stage on You know one of those just small, round, wooden tables that you kind of get in comedy clubs? The lamp? Aye. Aye, they, they're a very flammable venue. Yes, very, very wooden. Yeah, very wooden. Uh, very lots of candles. Of fire. Uh, and he jumped on a table from the stage with his nuts out and just <laughs> squatted over a tea light. Your little holy candles that you get in churches and chapels. Yeah. He's burning his nuts off to it. Although I think audiences now, like, if you had to do that shit, they would just, they'd probably put complaints in. Do you know what I mean? That's not what I was here for. I think there was a lot of complaints back then as well, you know. I was here for some some originality. This isn't, a, it's exactly original. No, was, it's not. I was there for a, a, an interesting take on technology. Mm-hmm. I'm always fascinated when you get a complaint for a comedy show and you're like, isn't it obvious... I'm in this job because I don't care. <laughs> like, I'm not really, it's not market research. <laughs> like, I remember doing one of my first weekends at the stand in Glasgow and the compare is, uh, I mean, there would be no doubt about his sexuality, clearly gay. The open... <laughs> The opening Did he occasionally act. threaten to pull the audience's hair out by the fucking roots? Yes, okay. he's that guy. He's that guy. Uh, the opening act was gay, and I was on the middle, and there were two gay guys at the front of the stage who said they found the show incredibly homophobic. And we were like, <laughs> fuck <laughs> sake. I always remember about that compare. Um, Andy Parsons, who didn't mock the week, said to me, I was up in the start stand in Glasgow last week. Very strange compare. <laughs> Not the talk of AIDS. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I know him. <laughs> I used to introduce Des Clark for no apparent reason. It was the phrase that um, David Ike used Global to... Global media is Des Clark. <laughs> Global media is Des Clark. 
David Icke used to use this phrase in his books when he would describe like Prince Philip or someone who really didn't like as paedophile serial killer and shapeshifter. <laughs> And I would always introduce Des Clark as that when I was comping for no real reason. But he never said anything. He was just like... That's so. how professional Des is. Hmm? That he'll just take that on the chin and go on and... What an absolute whiz kid. Do, he's, or, do his or, job. Or maybe it's true. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you think he has some kind of vampire-like relationship with... Do you think I think only the, only the serial killer and shapeshifter part. Yes. What yep. about being a lizard? Do you think you might be a lizard? It's kind of cold, isn't it? That compere talks a lot about lizards. Maybe he knows something. <laughs> <laughs> Big old Dez, man. He's great. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. He's just an implacable eye. <laughs> a lizard eye. <laughs> Unleaded. <laughs> How long have we done you? <laughs> I thought they were good. I it's a big political just, chunk in the middle. But I, think it's, it I think it's good that we've like got to a stage where we just it's all fucking capitalism. We need a revolution. <laughs> That's generally the place everything needs to arrive at. And the sooner you get there, it. That's it this week for Here Comes the Guillotine. We'll be back next week with more anti-authoritarianism and chummy laughter. You can get all the episodes of Here Comes the Guillotine on Global Player right now. Search for Global Player on your app store or go to globalplayer.com.